Hi guys and welcome back. In today's video we're going to be talking about the likelihood of and risk of developing a C. diff infection after using the antibiotic rifaximin. So for those of you who don't know, rifaximin is an antibiotic that is commonly used to treat SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and IBS, IBD, and other various GI and hepatic diseases. And the premise is simple, right? It's just like if you had an antibiotic that you took for a sinus infection or a lung infection or a foot infection, it's the same idea every time. You have an overgrowth of bad stuff, you kill it with the antibiotic, and then your body's able to heal and hopefully other better microbes can grow back in its place. So in the case of SIBO, for example, we know that SIBO is made up predominantly of E. coli and Klebsiella, when we suck out the juice from the small intestine, that is. So if we can kill E. coli and Klebsiella and spare the good bacteria, hopefully, then we would treat SIBO. And oftentimes that is the case. Now, the risk of using antibiotics needs to be paid attention to, though. So you could always develop resistance to an antibiotic. We actually talked about that in last week's video. So if you haven't checked it out yet, go ahead and check it out. I'll try to link it somewhere on here or down below. But you could always develop resistance against the antibiotic, which means that you're better off using it once or maybe twice. You don't want to be one of those people who winds up taking rifaximin eight or ten times in hopes of curing their SIBO or their IBS. That is going to be a, uh, a risky endeavor for numerous reasons. But then there's also the very real risk of developing C. diff infection. So what happens with C. diff is that the person will take an antibiotic, sometimes for acne, the sniffles, sinus infection, pneumonia, whatever it might be. You take an antibiotic and then whammo, you get a C. diff infection. And that's because C. diff is much more resistant to antibiotics than a lot of other bacteria. So normally a lot of us have some C. difficile living in our guts, but it's kept quiet and it's inhibited by the presence of other bacteria, which are out competing it for space and food. But if an antibiotic comes away, comes along and removes the other bacteria, it's kind of the physiological equivalent of taking your foot off the brake pedal. And if the car moves forward, that is C. diff infection in this analogy. So what happens is that C. diff is more tolerant to or resistant to antibiotics compared to a lot of the other gut microbes. So if you really hammer at the good gut microbes for long enough and their numbers dwindle, there's going to be a tipping point for each person where the C. diff can take advantage of that and come forth. And then the good bacteria might not be able to fully recover until the C. diff is eradicated. And that's where we get into other treatments like antibiotics for C. diff, ironically, or FMT, where you actually give the person new good bacteria to inhibit the C. diff. That's a topic for another video, though. But the question that comes up a lot, especially in SIBO forums and IBS forums, is, hey, I got prescribed rifaximin. Is there a possibility of getting C. diff because of this? And the answer, unfortunately, is yes. It's not super common, but it does happen. All you need to do is skim through some of these online SIBO groups and IBS groups and just search for the words rifaximin and C. diff. And you will see instances where people are sharing their their journey and they're saying, hey, I took rifaximin for a mild to moderate case of SIBO and then I got C. diff because of it. Or, hey, I took rifaximin for the second time for my IBS and then I got C. diff. So it does happen. It is out there. And luckily, those people are sharing their stories on Facebook forums. Of course, I would be curious, has anybody here on my channel experienced that? Let me know in the comments down below if you have taken rifaximin and then gotten C. diff because of it. I think that would be very useful for us to hear about your story if you wouldn't mind sharing that. But I will share at least one paper that I pulled up that I think would be relevant for the conversation because I wanted to... Um, I wanted to share some actual data and not just make this about my observations and what I've seen in the SIBO groups and the IBS groups, although that does have value. That is a form of data collection in and of itself. But let me go ahead and make my little head bubble here. Hold on. There we go. All right, so here's one paper that I thought relevant to share. So this is a 2017 article rifaximin resistant clostridium difficile strains isolated from symptomatic patients. So in this paper, they got samples or isolates from 276 C. diff positive patients. And it's important to know these are symptomatic patients. There are people walking around with asymptomatic C. diff. 
and there's a lot more people who are carriers of C. diff, but they don't have an infection or an overgrowth. You see that a lot with the GI map, for example. If you're curious about that stool test and learning more, I did a video about interpreting the GI map stool test. So just, uh, I'll try to remember to link it somewhere on the screen or down below, uh, or just search for this channel, search for GI map and it should pop up. But they had 276 consecutive samples taken from symptomatic positive C. diff patients and they found that 32.2% of those episodes were caused by resistant strains, rifaximin resistant strains. So it begs the question, right? Like, I don't know from this article how many of those patients took rifaximin in the weeks prior to their C. diff diagnosis. That might just be coincidental. Or maybe these people had taken rifaximin, you know, years prior for SIBO or IBS, but it does make you think if, let's, let's just play with numbers here, if about 30-ish percent of C. diff strains could theoretically be resistant to rifaximin, and then what is it, 15 or 20 percent of the global population has IBS, a very large number of those people in fact have SIBO causing their IBS symptoms, we start getting into some really hairy, scary numbers. We're like, all right, theoretically, if 15% of the world maybe took rifaximin to treat their IBS or their SIBO, and then 30% of those people are carriers of a C. diff strain that is in fact resistant to rifaximin, that's where we start getting into the really scary stuff of like, there's a likelihood that a fair number of those people could develop C. diff. Again, it doesn't seem to be that prevalent right now, so this could be an issue that becomes more prevalent and more common the more we overuse rifaximin and the more we prescribe it for things like SIBO and IBS. But I just want to paint that picture that there is a possibility. We have seen this at least with some symptomatic C. diff patients where they isolated the strain and looked at rifaximin resistance. It's out there, and again, you can see the testimonies and you can see the videos in the internet, and you can see how people got into this pickle themselves. So I mentioned this in the other video where we talked about rifaximin and the likelihood of resistance, but I want to point out that again, rifaximin is not going to cure your SIBO or your IBS, most likely, because it doesn't actually address the root cause. The overgrowth of the bad bacteria is a consequence of something else, and you need to be hunting for that something else. I actually have a series coming up where we're going to talk about SIBO root causes, which I think will be really helpful for a lot of you. But keep in mind that you want to have all of your ducks in a row to the best of your ability before you do the antimicrobial, right? So you don't want to go in guns ablazing on day one, find out, oh, I was diagnosed with SIBO. Oh my God, I get rifaximin. I'm going to cure it. Woo. When in fact, you also have poor motility or autoimmunity, or thyroid dysfunction, or iron deficiency, where you're not consuming enough calories and your body is in fight and flight starvation mode all the time, or you're getting crappy sleep, whatever it might be, there's so many underlying factors that you need to address, hopefully before you get to the antimicrobial stage, whether that's herbal antimicrobials, whether that's rifaximin, metronidazole, anything else, you ideally want to build yourself a healthy body or a more healthy body before you get to the killing phase, because the killing phase should only be used once or twice in an ideal world. It should be used sparingly and with caution, and especially be cautious if you have any sort of risk of C. diff. For myself, I know I've had a boatload of antibiotics in my lifetime. I was a chronic ear infection kid. I had Lyme disease. I've had sinus infections. I have had a lot of antibiotics in my lifetime. So each subsequent dose of, of antibiotics that I get now, I am very, very, very cautious because I know that I've already, I don't want to say decimated. That sounds so negative. I have um, compromised my microbiome enough times in my lifetime, and I don't want to set the stage for a potential C. diff infection by taking antibiotics willy-nilly. So I would offer the same to you. If you know that you've taken a lot of antibiotics in your lifetime, like I have, be very cautious and just keep your wits about you and try to use anything else first before you get to the antimicrobial phase of your SIBO journey. And if you are going to do antimicrobials, try to get your ducks in a row first, get some foundations laid before you get to that phase. 
I mean, there's a reason, honestly, when I teach FODMAP Freedom, the first five modules, we are talking about those foundations and we're getting the ducks in a row first. You don't actually get to the antimicrobial part of FODMAP Freedom until week six. Six, guys. Like halfway through a three-month program is where I finally get around to mentioning antimicrobials. And it's not because I'm anti-antimicrobials. Did that make sense? It did. I am not against antimicrobials and I use them all the time. It's just that you've got to lay the foundation first before you get to the antimicrobial thing because we are realistically going to run the risk of developing resistance. We're going to possibly kill off some of the good bacteria. You really want to get as much mileage out of your antimicrobial effort as humanly possible before you get there. And then you want to have more ducks falling into a row during and after your antimicrobial treatment. So again, that's only halfway through FODMAP Freedom. We still have five other modules on the other half of that talking about other ways that you could support your body and make sure that it has all of the tools it needs to be happy and ultimately SIBO resistant or SIBO proof. So as always, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate each and every one of you. Again, I would love to hear your story. If you have taken rifaximin, if you've had C. diff secondary to rifaximin, absolutely, I would love to hear about that in the comments. I think it's really helpful for people to learn from each other and know what is normal, what's abnormal, what have people been through before? Because a lot of this journey I find is very isolating for people. I know it was for me. When my gut was a train wreck and I was reacting to a million foods and I was bloating from drinking water of all things, I know that I felt really isolated and alone. And I felt like nobody had it as bad as me. I had this, like, I felt like everybody in the world had this wonderful, healthy gut and they were like pooping like champions every day. And I felt like I was the only one who was miserable and unhealthy and unhappy. So comment down below if you can. Again, that's another thing I like about FODMAP Freedom is we do get a nice group kind of um, environment going between the Facebook group and the weekly Q&As where we see each other, we get to talk to each other, but do talk in the comments. I do see most of them. I might not always get a chance to respond, but I do make a point to read a lot of your comments. So please do share your thoughts and your experiences below, and I will see you guys in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.